I have before me a newspaper article concerning the cancellation of a television show. It was a talk show, yes, another talk show, and it has been replaced by reruns of episodes of a syndicated sitcom. I never saw the show myself, but the article said that it had been reaching barely more than one million homes a day, and that was the reason for its demise. I know a little about the business of broadcasting, enough to understand the economics behind this move, but I still have to wonder when a show that is reaching more than a million people a day is called a failure. A million people every day. And they pull the plug without hesitation. Programming executives base their decisions on the numbers, and we know that numbers can be deceiving. For example, what does it mean to reach a home? Is it a group of people paying rapt attention? Or is it some guy in a barca lounger who's passed out in front of the tube? They both count. This show that reached over a million homes a day and still failed reminds me of my own career in broadcasting. I'm not sure whose idea it was. My guess is that the three of us were riding around, heading who knows where or why, and the car radio was on, and one of us said, shut that thing off. It was probably Davey. He had a low threshold for crap of any sort. Fix, who would have been driving, would have ignored Davy's request, so I must have turned it off. And then most likely I said something like, what a waste, all they do is blob, blab, and play the same stuff over and over. That's their format, said Fix. I know it was Fix who said that, only he would defend such stupidity. That's what they're supposed to do. Fix was happy when people did what they were supposed to do. Yeah, but think what they could do, I said. We could do a better job than that, said Davy. Yeah, we could, I said. You guys, said Fix, you're all talk. You kill me. You think you could do anything better than it's being done. You're full of it. Maybe so, I said, but Davy's right. We could do a whole lot better than that. Oh, yeah, said Fix, then why don't you get your own show? Because I don't want to do a radio show, I said. Why not, said Davy. Yeah, why not, said Fix. I don't know, I said. As usual, I was caught in the middle. I looked at the two of them. Fix was driving, Davy was next to him on the front seat, and I was leaning over the top of the seat from the back, between them. Fix was a guy who thought that if he could get his hands on the right equipment, he could run the world. Davy didn't think the world was worth running. We're not going to do it, are we? I said, knowing that full well that we were. I'll check it out, said Fix. The next day, he went to the offices of the only radio station we could pick up in his car. It was a tiny college AM radio outlet with a signal just strong enough to serve the campus, about a mile in any direction. Fix said they had little forest animals running on treadmills to supply the power. If you lived out in the country, you couldn't pick up the signal until you hit town. At that time, this college was located in a remote spot in the northeast section of the country, a time when there were such things as fairly remote areas. I'll define fairly remote by claiming that there wasn't a McDonald's within driving distance. There was one other radio station, a commercial operation in a town about 10 miles southeast, but it played polkas and waltzes and music for what Davy called dead people. Not even Fix could listen to that. Fix asked the manager of the college station if he had any time available on the air, and he said yes, as a matter of fact there was. Summer was coming, and there was no summer session back then. During summer, the college was deserted. All of the students fled. But the radio station had to continue 24 operations, seven days a week, or it would lose its license. Many of the people with programs on the air during the spring semester would be leaving for their homes. So yes, the manager of the station said. There was not only an opening, but there was a need for DJs. Fix could have a show if he wanted one. Simple as that. Almost as simple as that. There was one minor hitch, the station manager said. Did Fix have a license? He had to have a license in order to go on the air. Fix said he didn't have a license, but he'd get one if there was time. No problem, the manager said. All you have to do is study this booklet, drive down to Boston, pay 25 bucks, take the test, pass the test, get a license, come back here, and you're on the air. Fix came home with the good news. He told us we were in. We could actually have our own radio show. And while we were saying, okay, great, he told us that before we started, 
we'd have to go down to Boston, take a test, pay 25 bucks to get a license. Davy and I looked at each other. We didn't mind going down to Boston. Fix would drive, and we knew some folks down there. We could have a good time. But we didn't want to take any tests, and we didn't want to shell out 25 bucks, and most of all, we didn't want to get any license. Fix was all for getting a license. He liked pieces of paper signed by officials that authorized him to do things. Davy and I felt differently. We thought licenses were an abridgment of freedom. You had to get a license to drive, a license to buy and sell, a license to fish and hunt, a license to get married, a license to own a dog. Davy had a great dog, Lucy, but no license. Davy said the time would come when everybody would have to get a license in order to take a leak. He said the radio show was a good idea, but not worth getting a license. We could count him out. Fix started in on him, telling him that he had it backwards, as usual, that what licenses did was set you free. All you need is a piece of paper, he said. It's a license to steal. Davy wasn't sure about that, and I brought up the test and the $25, but Fix was relentless, as always. He wore us down, and we wound up driving down to Boston, shelling out $25 apiece, taking the test, and passing it. Fix said it was important that all three of us take it because... Well, he had a number of reasons, but by then he had worn us down to a nub, so we just went along with whatever he said. On our way back home, I said, now we got our licenses, you're absolutely sure they're going to let us do a program? Absolutely, said Fix. Just like that, it seemed so easy. He already told me our slot, Fix said. What's our slot, I said. Twelve to six, said Fix. Afternoon, said Davy. No, night, said Fix. You mean midnight to six in the morning, I yelped. Fix nodded. We can't do that. We'd have to quit our jobs. When do you think we can sleep? Relax, Fix said. It's only on Saturday night. We can sleep on Sunday. Midnight to six on Saturday night, I said. That's not a slot, Fix. That's a grave. Nobody's going to listen then. So, said Fix, I couldn't think of an answer to that. That's a good time, Davy said. He liked to work at night and sleep during the day. Fix was always after him for sleeping during the day and keeping him up at night. Fix gave a laugh and said, Hey, we're going to be DJs. I don't want to be a DJ, said Davy. I hate DJs. You hate everything. You can be whatever you want to be, said Fix. Okay? A DJ, said Davy. Fix, you're unbelievable. Only to you, said Fix. What about me, I said. You don't count, said Fix. Fix took our licenses into the station, came home beaming, and announced that our show would begin on the Saturday after classes ended. As the time for our debut grew nigh, I began to get nervous. Mike fright, the big difference between a good idea and actually having to produce, combined with total inexperience. I confessed my jitters to the others, and Fix laughed. I thought this was going to be such a piece of cake, he said. You said it was going to be easy. That's what I said, I said. Relax, he said. Nobody's going to be listening anyway. Not even you could screw this up. It was sound, convincing advice. Fix was right. No one would be listening. The transient college population would leave, and the remaining permanent residents, sixth-generation Yankees, would not be up at midnight on a Saturday, in the middle of a summer, listening to their radios. Besides, the signal wouldn't reach their homes anyway. And if by chance they did pick us up, they'd think they were hearing background squawk and shut us off. There were, they were regular listeners to the station that played music for dead people, and we wanted no part of that. We did whatever we wanted to do. We played the music we wanted to hear. There were no restrictions, no limitations. There was no one telling us what to do and no one listening, so who could we offend? We'd show up at 11.30 and relieve the poor soul who'd been stuck with the 6 to midnight show. He always looked like the loneliest person on earth, and he was thrilled at the chance to leave a few minutes early. He'd go out the door looking like he'd just been paroled from prison. Back in the studio, we'd start our party. We each carried in a bag with records on top. Under the records, we'd stock plenty of beer and food, enough to get us through the night. Fix manned the controls. He loved to do that, and neither Davy or I wanted anything to do with the dials and meters, so Fix became our engineer. Davy didn't like to talk, because that's what DJs did, so I did most of the announcing, if you could call it that. And we all played music, rock and roll, jazz, country, whatever we wanted. That's, this was before alternate rock stations began springing up on the FM dial. We had no format for our show. We did whatever we wanted to do. That was the name we gave the show, by the way. Our very own radio show. Dave called it, Davey called it the program without a program. 
Fix played what he called cuts from his favorite albums, long songs that were never aired on any other station. I told him to stop calling them cuts because he sounded like a butcher, but he never listened to me about anything and continued to play his cuts. He introduced himself as Captain Midnight. We were stunned the first time we heard it. He said a person in his showbiz needed a showbiz name. He thought he'd chosen a good one. This is your captain speaking, he'd say when he went on the air. Davey couldn't get over it. Fix calling himself Captain Midnight, and when he stopped laughing, he started calling himself Jet Jackson. I became Ichabod Mud with two D's. We pretended to be flying around in spaceships and drinking a lot of Ovaltine. Davey played songs, and so did I, and sometimes read short, short selections from books of poetry and prose. We also started making up stuff. We made up the weather, and we made up the news. Nixon was president then, and we made up a lot of stuff about him and Spiro Agnew, and announced it as late-breaking news. A lot of what we said was not very nice, but we knew nobody was listening, and there were no sponsors to worry about either. Davy and I used to do impromptu skits in which Betty Agnew and Pat Nixon shared confidences on how their men were in bed. Pat called her man Mr. President, while Betty encouraged Mr. Vice. We did not have to read a single ad the entire night, or play any of the carts stacked by the microphones. Fix wanted to play some of the carts, but that was only because he wanted to play with everything in the studio. Instead of that, we made up our own ads and sponsors. We had Dr. Sperling's authentic no-fat lard. We talked about how Dr. Sperling had invented this process that took the fat out of lard, and now people could kick without, cook without fear of grease. And this was years before the cholesterol scare. We had Mother Turner's guaranteed all-beef turkeys. Mother Turner was just a figurehead like Betty Crocker, was not just a figurehead like Betty Crocker or Aunt Jemima. She actually existed. Fix did her voice sometimes, and that got more laughs from Davy than Captain Midnight. Mother Turner raised her turkeys the way God intended from scratch, and the result was an all-beef turkey, which we promised would fall apart on your fork and melt in your mouth. On a more serious note, we also promoted complete sexual dominance, the cologne for people who mean business. One splash, we promised, and you'll be in total control. Then there was the first or second National City State Bank, which offered a weekly special on old wrinkled paper money. If you had any, we encouraged you to bring it in, and we'd pay you ten cents on the dollar for it, no matter how crummy it looked. No one took us up on the deal, of course, because no one was listening. As the weeks went by and our show got wilder and we thought better, we became more and more convinced of this. There was no one listening. It passed from being a firm belief into an accepted fact. Nobody but nobody was listening to us. That didn't discourage us, not one bit. We didn't give a hoot. It was our very own radio show, after all. On the contrary, it gave us a heady sense of freedom. We couldn't make a mistake or bother anybody, and so we just went, let it all hang out. We had a good time. Drank a mess of Ovaltine. The studio was on the third floor, the top floor of the building, and it had a huge old ceiling-to-floor windows that we could open at the bottom. That allowed us to sit out on the ledge, beer in hand, and take in the quiet of a cool summer night when it wasn't our turn at the mic. We'd also invite friends to come with us, help us party our way through the night. And then, as six o'clock approached and our replacement had not appeared, we'd reach into the station's classical record collection, pull out a symphony, and play what Fix called Miles of Mahler. Gustav II was his favorite. It played about 36 minutes on a side, I think. Then we'd leave the empty studio, drive to the room of the unfortunate person who was supposed to be relieving us, bang on the door, wake him from a sound sleep, and tell him he had about 15 minutes, and then the stu station would begin playing what Fix called Skip. On the air, we'd tease all the people who weren't listening to us sometimes. We'd offer the free beer and cigarettes to the tenth caller. We began to stage contests and giveaways, offering prizes that even TV game shows would envy, even though Davey didn't think it was as funny as I did. He said that doing parodies of DJs was the next thing to being a DJ, and it was just stupid and a waste of our show, not funny. But he let me go on doing it because I was entitled to do my part of the show the way I wanted to. I maybe overreacted to Davy's criticism because one night I announced the contest to end all contests. I offered to give away the radio station, lock, stock, woofers, and tweeters to the first caller, to anybody who wanted it bad enough to place 
a single phone call to the station. I made the offer with impunity, knowing that there, no one was out there who cared, no one who wanted the station, and finally, no one who was even listening. I was only doing it to get a rise out of Davy, and I could see him laughing when the phone rang. I'll tell you, we were in the midst of all this expensive electrical equipment, turntables and tape decks and switches galore, meters and microphones, but we all stared at that phone as if we had no idea on earth what it was or what we should do with it, and it continued to ring, and ring. My God Almighty, there had to be a living person on the other end. This was long before computers started placing animated calls. Maybe it's a wrong number, I said. Answer it, said Fix. I picked up the phone and said, Hello? I felt like I was making first contact with beings from outer space. Hello, said a male voice. Is this the radio station contest? Did I win? I put my hand over the phone and said, It's a guy. He wants to know if he won. Tell him yes, said Davy. Yes, I said into the phone. You're our winner. Great, he said. That's great. Who are you, I said. What's your name? Philip Tunbridge the Third. he said. I said, well, Phil, you just won yourself a radio station. Can you come over to collect your prize? In about a half hour, I can, he said. Okay, we'll be waiting, I said. Bye. I hung up and said, he's coming over. He wants the station. It's his, said Davy. He won it fair and square. I'll draw up the paper, said Fix. Fix did a nice job drawing up a document that looked a little like the Constitution of the United States. Fix knew some basic calligraphy and fancy lettering was most impressive. About a half hour later, our winner showed up, a little guy with sandy hair and glasses. We announced him over the air. He signed the document. We asked him to make a little speech if he wanted to. He said he was nervous, but he did make a, a little speech. I never thought I'd win a radio station, he said. It's a real kick. We were genuinely touched. We asked the new winner if he'd mind if we played some music on his radio station, and he said, no, not at all. Go right ahead. He didn't know how to work any of the equipment anyway. We asked him how he'd come to be listening at that hour. It was nearly 4 a.m., and he said, Oh, heck, I listen to you guys every week. You could have taken my clothes and hung me naked by my heels from the Statue of Liberty's torch. You do, I said. Davy and Fix were as astonished as I. You do, they said. Sure, said Phil. He said we could call him Phil, with a smile. You guys are great. We are, I said. This was incredible news. Not good news or bad news. It was too amazing for that. We not only had a listener, but we'd had one all along, and he liked what we were doing. He was a big fan of the Captain, Jet, and Icky. We asked Phil how he came to be listening to a radio at that hour on a Saturday mo a Sunday morning. He said he was a student at the college, and he'd been offered a grant to conduct research over the summer in the psychology department. Some research, Phil said. All they want me to do is take care of the animals for them. Phil was in charge of feeding pigeons, mice, rabbits, and turtles. He was also in charge of watering them and cleaning the cages, 17 turtles, 15 rabbits, 21 pigeons, and 34 mice. I, I have to do it in the morning, the afternoon, and at night. At night it takes longer because I have to weigh the pigeons and measure turtle urine, he said. You're on a grant that measures turtle whiz, said Davy. That's not what I signed on for, Phil said, but that's what they let me do. And at night I listen to the radio. It keeps me company. The shows during the week are nothing special, but you guys are great. I kind of look forward to Sunday nights, Saturday nights, and now this. I don't mind saying that we took a shine to our devoted listener and new boss. We let Phil play some records, and he announced them with a kind of awkward flair. Even Davy, who didn't go in for any of that jock jizz, said Phil did a real good job. Since Phil now owned the station and was such a big fan of our show, we decided to rename it in his honor and did so over the air changing it from our very own radio show to the Phil Tunbridge the Third Sound Explosion. The sound explosion bit was Fix's idea. Davy and I didn't think much of it, but Phil liked it, and he was the boss, so we went with it. At the end of the night, we put on a Mahler symphony, I think it was the sixth, and told Phil that the other people at the station might not understand about him winning it in a contest. Fix drew up another document, perfectly legal, but not as fancy as the first, in which Phil signed over all rights and titles to the previous owners of the station. We tossed that one away as we were leaving, and Phil kept the original as a reminder of his winning. We drove him back to his lair, lab. Thanks, guys, I'll never forget this, he said. 
We were so amazed at this turn of events that we forgot to wake up the morning guy, and as we were leaving the campus, we heard the sound of the, the end of the classical music and the beginning of Skip. And I must say, from the viewpoint of a broadcaster regarding his audience, that we didn't forget Phil either. The rest of the summer, for the duration of our show, we dedicated songs to him, asked for requests, had a Phil Tunbridge III hotline, and kept the name of the show. Even came up with a few products, especially for him, like the Phil Tunbridge III internationally calibrated turtle urine atomizer and Phil's magic beans. The changes in the show might have been slight, but in an intangible way, everything was different. We knew Phil was out there, and we did our best to please him. We worked harder than ever to put on a good show. The big addition to what we were doing was that after Phil showed up, we did it with a bit more heart. And I think we did a good job. Looking back on it now, I honestly feel that though our listeners, our demographic, you might say, were few, that is, one, we reached him very, very well. 